Today I'm reacting to season one, episode one of The Resident, the pilot episode where the chief of surgery does a robotic prostatectomy. I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. If you're new here, I like to react to medical TV shows that feature urology and tell you exactly what's going on, is this accurate, is it not, and teach you a little bit about urology in the meantime. You'll also find me answering some of your most asked questions in some of my videos, so make sure you check them out. And if you like what you see here, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. Classical music? Bill, yank that sucker so we can get out of here. No, the appendix hasn't burst, that's good news. Slippery little fellow. Did you guys know this is my first surgery with Dr. Bell? No kidding. I need to get a photo. Make it quick. Get in, you. Okay, first off, music is definitely a part of the operating room. I very often play music in the operating room, music that I enjoy. It helps keep me in a positive mood. It also helps me focus on what I'm doing. So it's very common. Some people do play classical. Some people play rock music, whatever their preference is. And number two, typically people don't in the middle of surgery tell the staff that, hey, this is my first surgery and someone doesn't pull out their cell phone to take a picture. That doesn't happen in the operating room like to commemorate a particular uh, experience during the operation. This is when we are completely and 100% focused on the patient so that we can get the work that we need to get done, not take selfies in the operating room. That is totally inappropriate. Go back to your stations. Oh, we're just having fun. He's out cold. He'll never know. Wait, I'm going to take a quick selfie. We're closer together. I wish we could do one without the mask. Quick, let me chew. Just one more. I think we got it. I'm going to send this to my mother. You get us on fire. Cameras on fire. You are. <laughs> oh, he's waking up. I need to up the seagull. Oh, my God. You get an artery on an appendectomy? You're losing blood fast. Only two liters of normal saline wide open. Call for four units of blood and two FFP stack and give them to Delmer. Back instruction. You have to claim something. He's lost at least two liters already. Come on, come on. We just lost a pulse PA rest. Okay. So certainly uh, traumatic events do happen in the operating room. This is obviously not accurate to what really goes on in the operating room. In the operating room, yes, sometimes anesthesia can get light, but the patient doesn't actually wake up. <laughs> CPR isn't gonna put all that blood back into his body. Don't die on me. No use. He is so dead. Time of death, 12.03. Dr. Bell! Well, I think we can all agree it was the misdose Sivo that led this unfortunate situation. Oh, what? You're kidding, right? The patient woke up. His arm hit my hand. You left the blade in the field. You nicked the artery. Well, you, you never should have located him for surgery in the first place. His INR was abnormal. The upper range of normal. Yeah, That's yeah, never going to fly. I'm, I'm flashing back to the time when you tore through that old woman's oropharynx on a routine intubation. Did that fly? I covered for you. Not this time. I'm chief of surgery, and he's at the end of a 30-hour shift. What did you see? Okay, 
this is a really traumatic event. In fact, I'm starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable just watching it because this is a really tragic event. This doesn't very often happen in surgery, particularly surgeries like appendectomies, which are quite routine. So this is an emotional moment for everyone in the operating room, the surgeon, the resident, the anesthesiologist, everyone is upset. It's not the time to be laying blame. It's not the time to be trying to figure out what exactly happened. These typically happen after major negative events in the hospital. So they look at all the different components that occurred in the operating room and that could have led to prevention of this possible outcome. And they meet together as a team and do this in a way that no one's at blame. They're trying to find the root cause of what was going on. Certainly in this particular scenario, there was a number of things going on. There was people taking selfies in the operating room. The anesthesiologist was not sitting at the bedside and monitoring the patient. The surgeon had a tremor and clearly he's got a little bit of an ego because he's the chief of surgery and doesn't want to be seen as an incompetent surgeon. I will say that no surgeon wants to be seen as an incompetent surgeon. There's a lot going on here, but this is not what would happen in real life. In real life, they would be focusing on the patient. The surgeon would go out and talk to the family. They would get documentation of what occurred and write what's called a death note, time of death, and to what happened in the operation. Maybe he had a heart attack. Yes, there's some family history of heart disease. Uh, yes, his left main clogged. Sudden cardiac event. I tried CPR, he was unresponsive. Uh, that works. Well, that's right. That's exactly right. No, there's no way to prevent this. Guys, this is so, so wrong on so many different levels. This does not happen in the hospital. Please do not feel like this would ever happen to your loved one or you in the operating room. This is never, would never, never fly at all, 100%. This is completely unethical and inappropriate. You came in here all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to save lives, but today you didn't save a life. You saved a brainstem because you didn't listen to me. Now the repercussions on Chloe's family will be catastrophic. There's no way they'll accept this. Chloe looks alive. They'll think she can wake up. So they will hover over her, tend to her for days, weeks, maybe years, waiting for a miracle to happen. That's utterly impossible. What was rule one, then? Do whatever you tell me to do. No questions asked. All we want to do is help our patients, but what they don't teach us in medical school is there are so many ways to do harm. Okay, so right before that scene, Devin had run a code on this young woman who had endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart. And she coded, which means she lost her pulse. They ran a code and she got her heart rate back, but it took 26 minutes. So after you have a code, which means that your heart is not pumping blood throughout your body, except for the compressions that doctors give you, uh, you can suffer permanent damage. So what he's discussing is that this woman likely lost her brain function because she didn't have oxygen to her brain for uh, 26 minutes or so. So ultimately, I think the take home from this is he's definitely right that there are things that we learn in medical school that kind of evolve over time. So you learn how to deal with people in certain circumstances based on their health condition, based on their home condition, and based on their quality of life. And a lot of those things can be different from what you learn in the textbook. And so any of you medical students who are watching out there, it is a learning process. That's why it takes so, so long. You learn the textbook knowledge and then you go on and you do residency for a certain number of years and then sometimes some specialty training in fellowship before you become a full-fledged doctor. And once you are done with all of that training, you will still have times where you don't know the right answer. I still ask my colleagues all the time and my mentors all the time for advice with particularly challenging cases. Cases.